Hello everyone, welcome to my video on approaches to developing an integrated project management plan. My name is Bill Bowen, I'm an instructor here at Algonquin College here in Ottawa, Canada. As part of one of my project management courses, I've asked my students to prepare a project management plan. And I've created this video to give the students a bit of guidance on strategies of how to approach this assignment. My goal is to answer as many of your questions as possible and hopefully get you started on the right track in fulfilling your project management assignment. So let's get started by first asking the question, what do we know about a project plan? Also sometimes referred to as a project implementation plan or PIP. We know that a project plan is a formal document created to guide the project's execution and control. And if we visualize the five phases of a project life cycle, that's the initiation, planning, execution, monitoring, controlling, and the closing phases. The project plan is created during the planning phase near the start of the project. If we then consider the inputs and outputs of a project plan, we know that several documents go into the creation of a project plan. This could be the statement of work, the project charter, whatever business case reasons, an understanding of the stakeholders' needs and requirements, pre-existing agreements and contracts. They go to create together to help the project manager to create the plan. The plan itself is usually created using expert judgment or a few other techniques that the project manager might have. Now let's take a look at what the project plan template will look like that we'll be using for this assignment. For this assignment, we'll be using a project plan template that's been divided up into three logical sections. The first section will introduce the project to the reader. Always assume that the reader is unfamiliar with the project and that you'll need to provide some background. In the second section of the document, we'll be looking at the actual planning of the project. In this section, we'll be developing our work breakdown structure, determining what is and is not in scope, taking a look at the requirements, how will the project be accepted, and we'll also be developing some schedules for the project. In the third section of the project management plan template, you'll be looking at the supporting plans that will be needed on your project. These would be your risk, your quality, your communication, and the other supporting plans. To make this project plan template walk through a little bit more meaningful, we're going to do it in context of an actual project. Our project's going to be installing a backyard pool enclosure fence. Many municipalities require that any body of water greater than 2 feet or 60 centimeters requires a fence around it to make sure that animals don't fall in or unsupervised children don't get access. Therefore, for our project, we're going to go through installing a fence. And as often as I can, I'll try and refer to the sections that we're doing in context of what would be appropriate for this type of a project. So let's take a look at the information content requirements for the first section. Remember, the purpose of the first section is to introduce the project to the reader. It also defines the conditions under which the project is valid. Let's see how we do that. The strategy for the first section is to ensure that you're providing the right information content for each of the template's topics. For example, in the executive summary, you should assume that the reader is unfamiliar with the project and provide a bit of background as to what the project's all about and what the justification for the project is. Why are you producing this as a project and not buying it off the shelf? What are the cost benefits of creating your own fence as opposed to getting someone else to do it? You should also look at the purpose for the project. Remember the purpose is a very high level statement. With our small little fence project, you might think that the purpose is to create a fence. But that's not really the reason we undertook the project. The actual purpose of the project is to make sure that we're compliant with all city requirements for a pool and that our backyard pool is safe. And that's what we really want to achieve with our fence. As for the objectives, objectives for a project are usually more tangible, more quantifiable, more measurable. What is it that we actually want as an output of this project? The objective of the project is to build the fence. And it builds on, on the purpose. The purpose is to achieve certification and safety. The objective defines how this is done. The next three sections of the project management plan are very important to us as project managers as they explain to, to the reader the conditions under which the plan is valid, why the plan was developed the way it was, and why the plan may not be achievable. These would be the assumptions, dependencies, and constraints. Assumptions are conditions that you've assumed to be true without being able to validate them. Essentially, you can think of assumptions as the conditions under which the plan is valid. The assumptions that you list 
also need to have had a direct impact on your planning process. In the case of our little backyard fence project, some of the assumptions that we may have made are uh, perhaps we've done a site inspection and we've developed our plan on the assumption that the backyard will remain in its current state until the construction of the fence begins. This may not be true. The homeowner, for example, may, for whatever reason, dump dirt in the backyard or change the backyard in such a way that our plan is no longer valid. By defining the conditions under which our plan is valid, we now have justification for changing the plan if one of our assumptions proves to be incorrect. Another assumption might be that key personnel will be available at the start of the project. There is no way that we can determine this ahead of time. However, for planning purposes, we need to make some assumptions or we'll never be able to proceed with our plan. Project external dependencies are people, organizations, or agencies whose support, cooperation, or approval is needed for the project to be successful. They are also agencies, people, or organizations who are beyond the direct control of the project manager or the project itself. For example, in our fence building project, we have a dependency on a material supplier. We don't have any direct control over them, and should the material be late or defective, then we may suffer schedule slippages or cost overruns, but we have no control over that. A city inspector would be another dependency for which we have no control over. They're the ones who approve the fence and whose final approval will determine whether the project is successful or not. Project constraints are factors that have been imposed on the project that, and that we need to accommodate within our planning process. Constraints, for example, might be weather. Weather is normally considered a risk due to its unpredictable nature. However, sometimes weather is predictable, such as ground frost, which occurs in Canada between December and March, making backyard construction very difficult. Unpredictable weather, such as storms or heat waves or something like that, would be considered a project risk, and we'll handle those under the risk section. The project can have a number of other constraints. Perhaps the client wishes us to only use local workers, materials, or suppliers, which will affect our procurement. Or perhaps the homeowner does not wish construction to begin before 8 a.m. so as not to disturb the neighbors. This impacts when, when the working day can begin and our scheduling of the workers. That gives you an idea of the type of information content that's expected in Section 1, where we're introducing the project to the reader. In Section 2, we get down to describing the project itself what is in scope, what is out of scope, breaking the scope down into deliverables, major work packages, and begin the process of developing a schedule for our project. It's at this point that I like to remind my students that as you prepare your document, remember, your reader may not be as familiar with project management tools and techniques as you are. Therefore, when you get to a section where you're expected to do a WBS or a Gantt or network diagram, or a milestone table, remember to provide a lead-in paragraph that explains to the reader the information being presented and helps guide them in interpreting the information. Section 2 is divided into two primary sections, defining the scope of the project, what's the project all about, and defining the schedule for the project. If you begin researching around, you'll find that there's many definitions for scope. People use it slightly different depending on the industry they're in, or the type of projects they're running. Sometimes scope is simply the deliverables and major work packages. In other cases, people use the term scope to describe everything associated with the project, including its assumptions, constraints, dependencies, acceptance criteria, requirements, etc. For this template, I've tried to make things easy by specifically defining what elements I expect to be included under scope. And if we take a look at them, I've tried to define scope as what are the major work element and what are the tangible deliverables that you'll receive as an outcome of this project. Think about work elements as the activities or the tasks that are involved. In our little backyard project, we're building a fence. The activities associated with the construction of the fence, the cleaning up, the procurement of materials, planning, drafting up the blueprints, all of those activities would be considered work elements. Anything that you get as an outcome of this project that you can hold in your hand, something that's tangible, the fence itself, a certification from the city saying that the fence has been approved, the test results, the project plan that you're going to develop, any tangible outcome of the project 
is considered a deliverable. Now remember, our project is only to build the fence. So there's a number of things that the client might think is associated with this project, but really is not. And it's important not only to list what is associated with the project in the form of major work elements and deliverables, but also clearly identify what is not. This helps set expectations with the client. For example, we're not building the actual pool. We're not doing any landscaping. When the pool becomes operational, we're not going to do any maintenance on the pool. If the homeowner wants any frisbees or beach balls or anything like that to go with the pool, we're not purchasing any of that as part of this project. So set the expectations for the project. What is included within the scope and what is not included in the scope. At this point, students usually ask me that while they understand terminology is important and that I'll be checking to make sure that the right content is added into each of the right sections, there are so many sections, where do they begin? This is an easy question. Begin with your WBS, which is a logical extension of your scope. The WBS should reflect your scope and I encourage you to spend some additional time on this section as it's key to every other section within this document. The WBS is usually expressed in one of two ways. Previously, it was always expressed in a table format because we didn't always have the graphical capabilities available to us to express it in an illustration. Today, we usually express a WBS in, as a graphical illustration hierarchical diagram that shows the project at the top, the project deliverables, and below that, the tasks and activities that we wish to formally track as part of this project. When I tell the students this, they're quite often surprised. They've studied the WBS, but they don't always realize how it's connected to the rest of the document. So for the rest of this discussion, we're going to be examining the other sections of the project management plan and how key the WBS is to those sections. So let's begin by starting to examine the WBS's impact on the other sections. From here on in, I won't necessarily follow the template, but I'll try and visit as many of the sections out of the template as possible to show you how they're all connected. Let's take a look at two closely related sections of the project management plan. That would be the requirements and the acceptance criteria. The requirements spell out what needs to be done on the project. The acceptance criteria test to determine whether those requirements have been met or not. Our WBS can have requirements based at the project level, the deliverable level, or the task or activity level. For example, in our little backyard fence project, the owner may have specified that a green chain link fence is to be used. Furthermore, the city may have imposed requirements such as the fence must have a spring-loaded automatically closing door. They may have also imposed requirements of how high the fence may be or whether or not there can be gaps in the fence between, let's say, the fence door and the fence itself. In each of these cases, there should be a corresponding acceptance criteria to determine whether or not the project has met its requirement. In the case of the green chain link fence, we may want to do an incoming inspection just to ensure the right materials have been delivered. With regards to the fence door, we may want to develop a metric. A metric is simply a project characteristic and a way of measuring it. For the fence door automatically closing, we may want to have a timing mechanism to make sure that the fence closes within three or four seconds of being opened. With regards to the height, again, we could simply have a measurement. Same with the gap. Be very careful to make sure that every acceptance criteria has a matching requirement. For example, an acceptance criteria of my kids must be happy with the pool is really outside of the project. The pool itself is beyond the scope of the project, so clearly this would not be a valid acceptance criteria. As well, there is no requirement in the project for your children to be happy with the pool. So for, the, for these two reasons, this would not be a valid acceptance criteria. When you're defining your requirements, be very careful to ensure that your requirements are quantifiable and measurable. This will allow them to make good test criteria. For example, a requirement that says the fence must look nice would not be a good requirement as the word nice is subjective. It means different things to different people. What your view of nice may be might be different than mine. So try and phrase each of your requirements in a very quantifiable way. The next two topics that I want to look at are risk and quality. The difference between these two topics are sometimes blurred. Keep things simple, I encourage students to think of risks as those unpredictable events 
that impact the project but originate from outside the project manager and project team's direct control. Quality issues, on the other hand, are also events that occur on the project but are usually under the control of the project manager or the project team itself. An example of risks in our little backyard fence project would be the theft of material, possibly of material being delivered late, random weather events such as storms, or possibility of defective material being developed, or the possibility of defective material being delivered. Quality issues, on the other hand, are those elements of the project which can go wrong, but the team has direct control under and can prevent. For example, ensuring that the fence does not lock to one side or the other, ensuring that the concrete has been mixed properly with the proper mi mixture of cement, sand, gravel, and water, ensuring that the gaps in the fence are within standards. All of these type of events are under the direct control of the project team and the project manager. And I've provided a little diagram there that shows just how risk management and quality management differ. All of these type of events are under the direct control of the project team and the project manager. And I've provided a little diagram there that shows just how risk management and quality management differ. Keep in mind that each risk you identify needs to have some impact on the project characteristics. These characteristics could be either the project's budget, schedule, quality, scope, the reputation of the project, uh, the worker's health, it's got to impact something on the project. If you've identified a risk event that could occur, such as a neighborhood dog barking at the workmen when they show up to install the fence, while this event may occur, it's unlikely to have any effect on the project whatsoever, so that would not be a valid risk. So at this point I've introduced the fact that there's a lot of definitions and terms and correct content that needs to be applied to your project management template. Over the next few slides, I want to start exploring more of the interconnection between the WBS and the various sections of the document that you'll be working on. So let's explore further the importance of the WBS. We've already explored the fact that the requirements and acceptance criteria for the project are linked directly to WBS items. Each requirement that you have in your project needs to either be associated with the project itself, a deliverable, or an individual task or activity within your WBS. And of course, each acceptance criteria needs to be linked to a requirement. This makes it extremely easy in the future to change the scope of your project. Should you eliminate tasks or entire deliverables, you can simply eliminate the, the associated requirements and acceptance criteria. Adding tasks and deliverables also means that you simply need to add their associated requirements and acceptance criteria and link them to the new WBS items. Next, let's explore how your scheduling techniques and your WBS interrelate with each other. Your scheduling techniques, such as your Gantt chart, your network diagram, or your project management table, all draw upon the information that's in your WBS. The tasks and activities and deliverables that you define should be reflected within your schedule. If you have tasks within your WBS which are not scheduled, the reader will assume that these tasks are not going to be done. Subsequently, if you have tasks within your schedule which are not in your WBS, there's a disconnect somewhere in the project. Something is inconsistent, and inconsistencies usually means errors of some kind. So as you develop your Gantt chart, make sure you incorporate all the activities and tasks within your WBS as well. When you move on to your network diagram and you're showing your critical path, the slack of tasks, the early start, early finish, except information, again, draw upon the same tasks and activities that you have within your WBS. Your last one, your, your project milestone table. Remember, a milestone is simply a moment in time where a critical decision has been made for the project. And these are usually the events that the project manager wants to keep an eye on and keep focused on, as they're very important to the project. Often students simply select the major deliverables as their milestones, which is fine, works for most cases. Keep in mind though, some deliverables will not be milestones, and it is possible that milestones may not be a deliverable. In either case though, I encourage you not only to provide the milestone identification, 
the date, keep in mind it's a moment in time so it does not have a duration like a task, but also provide a description of the milestone to the reader so that the reader understands the significance of this date. Now let's explore how your quality management plan and your WBS are related. Within your quality management plan, you have to identify areas of quality concern. You can identify standards for which the work must be performed either through quality requirements, quality specifications, or quality standards. Every time you identify a requirement, specification, or standard, it should be mapped to an individual WBS item. That item could be the project itself, deliverables, or activities or tasks. Having identified a standard, requirement, or specification that the work for the project needs to be upheld to, you then need to identify a metric of some kind to measure to see whether the project is obtaining its proper quality standard. A metric, if you remember, is simply a project attribute or characteristic and a way of measuring it. In the case of our swinging door, if the door needs to close within four seconds, the metric would simply be to measure the door. I often encourage my students to map out a few of their processes in the form of a block diagram that shows the process for which the work will be carried out, including the activities themselves and potential points where quality checkpoints could be added into the process to ensure that the work is being done correctly. For this assignment, I do not expect every single process to be broke down that is beyond the scope of the assignment, but I do expect one or two examples of a process being broke down. As for your quality standards, requirements, and specifications, I expect you to only provide examples of those, not all of them. If you were to provide perhaps a half dozen to go show a nice range of quality standards, specifications, and requirements appropriate for this project, that would be sufficient to demonstrate your knowledge. Next, let's look at the risk section of your project management plan. When approaching your risk section, make sure you provide the reader with sufficient supporting information that they develop confidence and can appreciate your risk registry. For example, you may wish to describe how the risks themselves were identified, or you may wish to describe the process by which the risk analysis was conducted. Within the risk registry itself, as you identify risks for this project, make sure that each risk is linked to a WBS item, either the project itself, the project deliverables, or project individual tasks or activities, and provide sufficient description of the risk to the reader that they can understand and appreciate the risk. You need also identify the probability and impact of each risk. When identifying a risk probability or the likelihood that a risk might occur, it is sufficient to use scales such as low, medium, or high, as long as you support those scales with a quantifiable description of what low, medium, and high means. Low, medium, and high are subjective terms. For one person, a low risk might be a risk below 10%, where another person may feel a low risk is below 0.1%. So quantifiably define each term that you use. This goes for risk impact as well. If you use a scale such as low, medium, and high, you need to quantifiably define what that means. But risk impact is a bit more complicated than risk probability, because risks can impact different characteristics of a project. For example, a risk may impact the project's budget, scope, schedule. It may have some effect on the stakeholders, the reputation of the project. And as such, as you define the scale, make sure you define low impact as it associates to budget, low impact as it associates to scope. I would encourage you to check out page 318 of the PIMPOC as it provides an excellent table for how to associate project impact on a project. You may wish to include other supporting information, such as how risks are, are prioritized. Often inexperienced project managers will simply take the probability of a risk event occurring, multiply it by its impact, and come up with some magic number. I would recommend a more formal approach to determining the priority of the risk. Examine whether the risk impacts worker safety or the health of those on the project or other stakeholders. Examine what your tolerance towards the risk is. For example, if the risk will only impact the budget, but you have a large contingency, that, may, that risk may not be prioritized high. Also examine the period of time that the risk occurs in. Risks that occurred near the beginning of the project, you may have time to recover for before the end, in which case you may prioritize them lower. Also think about the certainty of the data that you're using. If, for example, you have 
risks that you've identified that you have historical data on, you may have more confidence in those risks than risks that you just identified through brainstorming, but you're not really certain whether they will occur or not. So as you look at prioritizing your risk, think about what factors you would need to consider to determine what priority to put on that risk. You may want to include other information such as your how you would detect your risk. You should definitely include what your risk response and what your risk strategy is. Don't forget, strategy in their, our courses are generally thought of as transfer strategy, mitigate strategy, avoid strategy, or an acceptance strategy. Having defined the schedule, having defined the quality elements of the project and the risk elements of the project, we can now look at assigning people to the task. And there's usually two ways that I encourage students to approach this section. One, they should develop a responsibility assignment matrix, such as a, a Reiki. A Reiki is simply where you take the WBS tasks and activities and assign them to individual team members. Within a Reiki, you'd only be looking at assigning tasks to the key team members who either have decision-making authority or actually action the tasks or need to be consulted or informed on the task. You should also consider developing a histogram of some kind. I've provided a simple diagram of a histogram, but really you can use any type that you wish. This is where you assign your workers onto individual tasks. By doing so, you know how many people will be required for any particular task. Now let's take a look at the costing or budget section of your project management plan. As with your previous section, your budget is based directly on your WBS items. This is where you allocate funds to each WBS item, such as your deliverables, your activities, or your tasks. I am not as interested in seeing accurate numbers here as I am seeing a logical approach to your budget section. Each of your WBS items should be broken down into material and labor costs at a minimum. You may find other categories you wish to apply, but at a minimum you should apply those too. You also need to start examining the previous sections of your project management plan. You need to provide funding to your risk management plan, for example. If you've taken a transfer strategy with any of your risks and purchased, for example, an insurance policy, those expenses need to be reflected within your budget. If you've allocated tasks such as risk monitoring or updating the risk plan or redistributing the risk plan, if you've allocated those tasks, you need to make sure that resources are assigned to those within your HR section and that funding is assigned within your budget section. Same goes for your quality plans. If you determine that you need a quality audit or quality checkpoints, those activities need to be funded and you need to assign resources within your HR section. You may have other PM activities that you have identified that you would like to do. These could be uh, kickoff meetings, team development, or team training of some kind. Any of these type of activities need to be funded. You also need to put, assign resources and funding to ongoing activities, such as developing status reports and anything else that you would like to do. I should be able to see these activities funded within your budget. Your contingency fund needs to be linked directly to your, your risk registry. If you've said that you need an extra so many dollars, there needs to be justification for these dollars. The client simply won't assign them up sign off on them just because you want them. But if you've shown within your risk registry that there is uncertainty that these dollars may be needed or they may be needed to fund part of your quality plan or some of your other plans, then the reader will find this acceptable. As long as you provided a clear justification within your other plans for your contingency fund. Having gone through the first walkthrough of your project management plan, you've probably now realized that your WBS needs to be updated. You've identified activities that were not originally on your WBS, and they now need to be reflected there. These would be all the activities associated with part of your risk management plan, such as your risk detection, uh, updating the plan itself, distributing the plan, ongoing activities. Quality management plan, you may have identified the need for audits or checkpoints, which were not originally there. Same for your scope management plan, your procurement plan, or your communication plan. If you have any of these activities, they should be reflected within your WBS. Any project management tasks themselves, such as your startup activities, your ongoing activities, or your closeout activities, should also be reflected within your plan. This is where you begin to have to link the entire plan together. As you've identified these additional activities, you need to be able to fund them, you need to schedule them, and you need to assign resources to them. 
This is where the consistency in the interconnection of the plan really begins to come together and where I begin to look for gaps within the plan. Have you called out an audit, but you haven't actually assigned anybody to do the audit or provided funding for the audit? These inconsistencies will become very glaring. I would now encourage you to stand back and look at all the tools and techniques that are used within the project management plan and how they are all connected with each other through the WBS. We've already explored that if you add a new task, such as the need for a quality audit, this audit or task needs to be funded within the budget, it needs to be scheduled within your Gantt chart, and it needs to have resources assigned to it within your histogram. From my perspective, Ensuring the integrity of all these connections is what makes a valid plan. Although not required for this assignment, you can clearly see at this point that you can begin combining tools and techniques within the project plan to, to find new ways to present information. For example, your Gantt chart could be combined with your budget and you could develop a project expenditure over time chart, which is different than what you currently have. You could combine your Gantt chart with your risk registry and develop a graph that would show periods of elevated risks throughout the project. As you become more familiar with these tools and techniques, you'll see that they can be combined in different ways to convey information to the reader in very concise ways. That wraps up the overview of the assignment itself. And I hope that I've given you enough information that you can start to develop your own strategies for how you wish to approach the project management plan. I would like to point out that there are several valid approaches to each section of your project management plan. What I provided today was merely demonstrations or examples of how the sections might be approached. For example, while I used the deliverable-based WBS in all of my presentations today, the pin box shows two other very valid approaches, which is a stakeholder-based WBS or a phased-based WBS. You may find within your textbooks or within your research other ways to present and break down your data that is perhaps more valid for your particular project. In my mind, the valid answer or the valid approach is the way that best communicates the information to the reader. And I would encourage you to explore different techniques to find the ones that will allow you to communicate most effectively. You may find this information online within our Blackboard material, within your course textbooks, such as the PMBOK. You are free to do online searches to try and determine best approaches. If you use any material from the, the internet, remember to properly cite and reference it. Your local library is a great source of material. And as always, I can always be reached by email if you have specific questions. Thus, we have reached the end of what has turned out to be a very long walkthrough of the project management plan template. I hope you found it beneficial, I hope you found it useful, and I hope it's given you some strategies on how to approach your assignment. Keep in mind, focus in on each section of the, of the project management template. The college has given me a marking scheme that maps to the template that I must follow, and to maximize your mark, make sure you target each section of the template effectively. Also keep in mind, your objective is to demonstrate your understanding and ability to utilize the tools and techniques that you've learned as part of this program. And of course, take every opportunity to demonstrate the learning requirements for each individual sections. I wish you all the best. I look forward to your assignments. I'll provide you as much beneficial and helpful feedback as I can. And I wish you all the best in your project management careers.